Hey everybody, my name is Suede, and let's talk about the mistake that new players make when they're playing Civilization 3. So the first mistake is going to be not doing rapid expansion and building too many wonders or buildings early on in the game. So early in the game, if I'm doing a if I'm not doing a military rush, sorry, I'm pretty much only building three things: warriors, workers, and settlers. Maybe a granary or two. Things that will speed up my expansion phase. Far too often, new players get distracted by all the other options they have, and they expand slower than the AI, because they're build busy building like walls or marketplaces or coliseums or whatever. The idea here is that once the city spots on the map are taken by the AI, they are gone. It's like losing a city. But meanwhile, the opportunity to build walls or a marketplace or a temple or whatever isn't going anywhere. So you want to grab all the city spots first by building settlers, and then once all the land is taken up, you can build whatever buildings you want. This applies to wonders too, uh, but like I know on forums, wonder addiction has gotten a lot of tensions because some new players like they build all of the wonders and that's all they build in the early game. Uh, so that's problematic, but at least there's like a, a reason behind building the wonders early uh, because the wonders are like a race. So if you don't build it soon, it's gone, just like those city spots uh, and unlike buildings, uh, interestingly. But generally, it's better to have cities than most ancient era wonders, so you should definitely focus on expansion until the end of the expansion phase, like until all the city spots are taken up. So here's an example from a save file that a player sent me, and if we retire the game, you'll see how bad it was. So they just did no expansion during, or during the early phase, and remind you, this is on Chieftain, so the, it takes the AI twice as long to produce anything and twice as long to grow. But towards the end of the game, uh, the human player had four cities, and each of the AI had about 15 or 16 cities. So it doesn't matter how good you are at the game, or, I mean, it does, but basically if the AI has, like, twice or three times as many cities as you, they will be teching much faster than you, they will be producing a million more military units than you, and it'll be very, very hard for you to keep up. So for that reason, you're going to want a lot of cities, and that reason for that reason, you're going to want to focus on expansion early on. So, uh, the next point on our list, we'll load that one up. It's going to be prioritizing happiness buildings or using entertainers. So to clarify, that's something that you don't want to do. Do not prioritize happiness buildings or use entertainers, if you can help it. So, uh, first of all, I'll clear up a misconception. You do not... You're allowed to have unhappy citizens. The only problem is when the number of unhappy citizens outnumbers the number of happy citizens. So it's okay if they're like even like this. Uh, it's okay for these guys to exist. You just can't have more unhappy than happy. So secondly, uh, if you're having happiness issues, the best solution is to use luxuries. Learn how to work the trade system and trade luxuries with the, the enemy civs to get their luxuries. Uh, if you have six luxuries plus a marketplace, that will give you 12 happy faces. And unless you encounter war wariness, that is all the happiness that you will ever need. If you can't get luxuries, then use military police, and if that's still not working, then use the happiness slider. So for those of you who don't know, happiness slider is here in the domestic advisor. This is a very good thing to use. Uh, and I'll explain why it's a good thing to use. So the happiness slider converts gold to happy faces at a 1 to 1 ratio. That's the same as what a temple does. A temple costs 1 maintenance per turn, and it gives 1 happy face. The luxury slider also converts 1 gold per turn into one happy face. So when you build a temple, you pay 30 or 60 shields in order to do something that could have been done for free just by visiting your domestic advisor. Uh, and you could have spent those shields on something else. If you need a temple for culture, that's fine. It might be worth building a temple, uh, but they're mostly a culture building. You shouldn't be using them as your main solution to the happiness problems. Now, if you thought that was bad, entertainers are even worse than the temple. Generally, uh, we say that shields and food have about the same value as each other, and that one shield is worth about three commerce. So that means if we want to fix this pro happiness problem in Moscow, and we're using an entertainer for it, we need to do this. So one food, two food, and a shield. So that's worth about nine commerce, because it's three commerce per food and per shield, and then one commerce over here. So that's a total of the equivalent of 10 commerce that we're giving up by making this guy happy fa uh, uh, an entertainer. So let's say we're really smart about this too. So we make him uh, a scientist. So we recoup three commerce there. So the net total is having fixed that problem cost us 
seven gold per turn, or the equivalent of seven gold per turn. What happens if we use the happiness ladder instead? It literally costs us one gold per turn. So what would you rather have? Losing seven gold per turn or losing one gold per turn? I'd much rather lose one gold per turn, so that's why we use the happiness slider. The only disadvantage to the happiness slider, it's not even really a disadvantage, it's just that you have to set one uniform rate for your entire empire, but you should definitely be using it. And it should be the chief way that you solve your happiness problems if you don't have enough luxuries. So, uh, the next item on our list is going to be, I mean, in the same direction as what we were talking about, is going to be overvaluing culture. Uh, so this is one another reason that new players build a ton of temples. So you remember the guy from the first game who didn't build enough cities? He played another game after I gave him the advice to build more cities, and he did build more cities. He's in a pretty good spot here, uh, but he's having some issues. But one issue that he's not having that he thought he was having was he that he didn't have enough culture. And you know what? I'm going to give him a pass on thinking this, because his uh, advisors were saying, you're not as good in culture compared to this one other civ. And so that's definitely... I mean, you're supposed to listen to your advisors, right? Except no, uh, because there's just no mechanism through which that would ever cause him any problems or ways that he'd be rewarded for increasing his culture in this game. Culture does almost nothing in the game. There's very few mecha er, mechanisms in the game through which culture will lead you to victory. So, uh, the culture flip mechanism is only problematic in recently conquered cities, but even that doesn't really apply until the medieval era or later, since the enemy doesn't have much culture in the ancient era. Outside of conquest, losing or taking a city via culture flips is either very unlikely, or it's only going to happen in very marginal cities. And so because of this, if you're not going for mid-game conquest, and you're not going for cultural victory, that's obviously one other exception, uh, there's just no reason to be focusing on culture. It's not a priority. Sure, you need 10 culture to expand your borders and get the full fat cross. So, uh, for example, here you can only use these tiles once you expand your borders to 10 culture. Uh, but beyond that 10 culture, quit worrying about it and stop prioritizing cultural buildings. Hey everybody, here's part 4 from our list, and that is going to be unit support. So, if a new player complains that they're going broke and you load up their save file, 99% of the time, it's going to be because of unit costs. I've had niche games where, like, I personally was broke because I built a lot of buildings and the buildings cost maintenance, uh, like when I was trying for a 100k culture victory. Or I've been broke because of the luxury slider because I slave Gallic Swordsman like a maniac. But new players, they don't play like that. If someone is new to Civ 3 and they're broke, I can just, like, I, I just know that they're broke because of unit support. Every single damn save file. Outdated units in useless positions, costing them 20, 60, 100 gold per turn sometimes. So this example, uh, at least this guy has a healthy economy so he can pay for these units, but he's paying so much money for these units. Like he's in Republic, so that's two gold per turn per unit over the unit cap. And then he's like 70 units over the unit cap. So it's costing him 138 gold every single turn just to keep these units. So part six from my, or part five of my list, uh, and this one is such a persistent issue that I need to split it up from the previous one and make it its own entry. And that's having units where they're not needed. So many of these cities, or so many, so many of these units that new players keep around are in cities that will never be attacked. You need an army, but you don't need nearly as many defensive units that you think you need. Just a couple defensive units in border cities, and the rest of your army should be knights or cavalry, something high mobility like that. The reason for that is that these units have high movement points and they can protect way more cities. Uh, if they cover more cities, that means you need to build fewer units, allowing you to uh, keep lower unit costs. It also means you can disband those extra units, and don't be scared of doing that. If you have units that you're not using, just disband them if they're not worth the cost of paying for them. So what I said about mobility, like once you have railroads, you have instant mobility across your entire empire. So there's no reason to be keeping units in like cities like... Kish, for example. Nobody can possibly to be attacked Kish. I mean, I guess if you had like a, a rite of passage with somebody, they could... So maybe you'd want to keep like one drafted Tau infantry if you're doing rite of passages with people. But otherwise, anytime someone threatens Kish, you're going to know several turns in advance. Like if they drop off a bunch of units, then you can just move them in in reaction to what the AI did. 
you don't need to be keeping this many units in the city. So what I'd do is, if I was in the save file, I'd disband like every single drafted rifleman, and it seems he's got like 40, right off the bat, just disband them all, you don't need them, you don't ne need nearly as many defensive units as you think you do, and put the defensive units in the border cities, in the cities that might actually be attacked, and you're going to be much better off. This also applies on offense, like when you're doing an attack, just put all of your units in a stack and go kill the enemy. Do not keep offensive units fortified in random cities or keep units in reserve or something like that. Use all your offensive units when you're mounting an offensive attack. So uh, number six is going to be letting the AI run away with the game. And uh, so I'll set the scene for you. Let's say you have average land. You have an average expansion phase. Maybe you get some great wonders. You do pretty solid in tech. That's great. But when one of the AI players has done decidedly above average, playing like that isn't going to win you the game. You have to be above average, or at least weaken the other strong civs in the map, make them below average. This is mostly a problem on Monarch or Regent. Below Regent, you get some handicaps in your favor relative to the AI. Uh, I mean, as in their growth, their techs, their buildings, and their units cost more than yours. And so if you have like even land compared to the AI civ, you're probably doing better than them. Uh, but on Regent or higher, you don't get those handicaps. Uh, so you have to actually do something with the game in order to win. You can expand faster and claim more land. If not that, you can conquer countries. You can maybe uh, trade for every lecture on the map, gain a tech lead. And if you didn't do any of that, and one of the AI civs is running away with the game, then just convince all the other AI civs to gang up on them and fight a war. I'm talking about the Zulu here, because the Zulu are going to win if you do nothing. Just get a military alliance with every other civ on the map against the Zulu, because otherwise the Zulu are going to win this game. If you recognize that you're not winning, like if another AI civ has better tech and score than you, you have to do something about it. The good news is you have hundreds of turns to gain some sort of edge and to make some sort of plan, but just do it before it's too late. So, uh, number seven on our list. Oh, this is actually, this save file is actually an example of having a lot of outdated units, like Stone Age Warrior in 1977. So, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, next on our list is not building enough workers and not working enough tiles. So, uh, you should be working every single tile in your empire and making sure it has roads and then mine or irrigation under it. Especially, especially if the tile is actually being used by the city. Like this tile is not being used. This tile is not being used by the city, so it's less essential there. But if the city is using the tile, it needs to have as many improvements as possible. So you need at least 1.5 workers per city, generally. So four cities here, you're going to want at least six workers. You can kind of skimp on workers in the expansion phase when you're focused on claiming more land. Uh, but afterwards, you need to catch up in terms of worker. Build them in those shitty, corrupt cities that I pressured you to build in part one of this video. I told you they'd come in handy. So look at the save file here. It's the medieval era, and not all the tiles are worked. That's just gold and shields down the toilet. Like, look at the capital here. This tile has no road. That's costing him one gold. This one's costing him one gold. This, 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 this. Uh, plus, if he was in Republic, he'd be costing him two gold, because you get plus one for every tile that already has plus one. And then all of this is multiplied by whatever multipliers you're getting from your buildings. So your marketplaces, your libraries, your universities, etc. So this could be called, each of these could be costing him two gold per turn, realistically. That is so much gold to be throwing down the toilet. So if your citizens are working a tile and you haven't improved it yet, you're throwing, throwing gold or shields or food down the toilet. Like I said, this is acceptable sometimes in the expansion phase, since it's hard to build enough workers when you're busy building settlers. But once the expansion phase is done, you have no excuse. This is your top priority. Build more workers. And if you want one more example of that, I'll show you another save. So this is the modern era. And this guy still hasn't improved the, the tiles around his capital. Like, this could be irrigated. All of these tiles could be roaded. And that's plus one commerce, plus one commerce, plus one commerce that he's just giving up by not having these roads. This is a big deal. He doesn't have enough railroads because he doesn't have enough workers. He has a million jungle because he doesn't have enough workers. He's drowning in pollution because he doesn't have enough workers. Build more workers. This is the solution to all your problems. I want you guys to see not having workers the same way that you see, like, not having a marketplace or not having a, a library in your capital. You should be seeing it as suboptimal, that you're just like missing out on something that you could have. 
So yeah, that's it for the video. I hope you guys enjoyed. Uh, let me know what you guys think in the comments. And uh, just in the future, I was actually thinking of doing a series like this where I would... You guys would send me your save files that you've given up on that you think are unwinnable, and I would win them for you. So I would show you what you need to do to, to fix your save file and to win the game. So yeah, uh, just send me your save files if you're interested in having your save file featured in a city like that. 